All right. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? How about this beautiful weather out there, huh? And how about the Chiefs tonight in the Super Bowl? Can I get a little cheer? Yeah, I figure that would get you. That got them really excited in the first service. So uh, just hopefully we can beat that California team that shall remain nameless. That's just what we'll say. That's, we'll leave it at that. Um, if you're new with us, let me say welcome to you especially. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor here at Bible Christian and happy that you're here. Um, after the services, I tend to hang out out in the connection point, which is right out these doors. And uh, so if you're new or maybe if you've been coming for a few weeks and we just haven't met yet, stop by there and say hello. I've got a little gift I'd like to give you and I'd like just be able to get to know you and your family or whoever there is, is there with you a little bit better. Um, if you get a minute, stop by there right afterwards, and that'd be fantastic. Um, if you missed last weekend, guys, you missed a huge, huge weekend. Uh, last weekend was Vision Weekend here for our church, and we celebrated uh, much of what God did in 2019, and we talked about some vision about what God has for us in 2020. And we, what we did is we kind of uh, further crystallized or fur, further specified what our vision means. And we, we use the phrase around here all the time that we bring life to our community. That's our vision to bring life to our community. And last weekend, we talked about how that we bring life to our community by giving every man, woman, boy, and girl the opportunity to see and hear the life-changing gospel of Jesus. And so this year, as we push forward, as we put our foot on the gas pedal for the vision God's given us, uh, we want people right in the front of our focus. Every person you see, every person that you meet, uh, they have an eternal destination uh, that, that's coming. And so we want to be a part of, of drawing them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, um, if you missed it last week, I know we had some people that were sick, um, hop on the website, hop on the app, get on YouTube, on our channel, and watch that uh, sermon video. In addition, we have... Uh, three other videos on there that we showed last weekend celebrating some of the ministry areas of our church. So hop on there and check those out. If you didn't get a chance to, you don't want to miss out on uh, what God did this past weekend. Um, let me remind you as well, as you exit out the, the doors today, we've got some booths set up for uh, some of the serving areas here in our church, some of our ministry areas. We've got a children's ministry one over here, a student ministry right outside these doors, and then just out these doors to the left is the First Impressions booth. If you're not serving here at BCC, uh, we believe that God's given you gifts and abilities and talents that he wants you to use for his service. Now, and one of the ways we're going to accomplish that vision that we talked about last weekend is by all of us working together, uh, contributing our, our talents and uh, our abilities and our gifts uh, toward the vision. And so if you're not serving in one of those areas, just stop in and have a conversation with a few of the people. I've told them not to pressure you too much, okay? But they're going to try to close you if you stop, all right? They're going to close the deal if you stop, hopefully. we well, just stop by, talk about it, even if it doesn't end up being the right fit, stop by and have a conversation. When you do, if you sign up to serve, um, they're going to give you a little card for something that's called Infuse. Everybody say Infuse. Okay? Uh, that was, uh, come on, guys. All right. Everybody say Infuse. That was really, really lame and weak. All right, we're not going to do that this morning. All right, Infuse is a new leadership development gathering that we're going to be doing in February, okay, later this month. February 23rd, right after the 1030 worship celebration, uh, we're going to gather down in the student center, and this is for all of our current volunteers, all of our new volunteers, all of our, if you consider yourself an old volunteer, whatever that means to you. Uh, this is for everybody serving in all the ministry areas. And our desire is that we would help our leaders move forward. That's our, that's our vision for that, that ministry and that gathering. We want to train you. We want to help you develop as a leader so that you can be a better leader at your workplace, in your home, and right here at BCC, wherever God has you serving right here within our context. So mark your calendars for February the 23rd. That's going to be coming super quick, and uh, you don't want to miss that. Now, today we are going to be uh, jumping into a new series. I'm going to pray for us in a minute, but we're jumping into a new series. It's a little break from the story for the next two weeks. So this weekend and next weekend, you can hang up your story Bibles uh, just for those two weeks and bring your regular Bibles. Uh, there's some in the seat back in front of you if you want to reference those as well. And we're going to be in a series called Money talks. Now, everybody just got really tense right there when I said the word money in church. I know. I want you to look at your neighbor. Everybody look at your neighbor. Go. Look, look, look. Say, relax. We already took the offering. All right? You're good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. But here, here's what I will, I, here's what the deal I'll make with you. If you will take what God's given us over the next two weeks to talk about, that is so, so super practical, and you will apply it to your finances, this has the ability to change your finances and literally change your lives. I, I, that is not an exaggeration by any stretch. And it's very, very simple. As a matter of fact, today when you leave, there will be no ifs, ands, or buts about what did he want us to do whenever we left there today? Like, it'll be so clear. It'll be 
be so crystal. And if you will commit to saying, I'm going to apply this to my finances, I truly believe God wants to transform some of your financial situations. I really do. So let's pray. And with that in mind, and we're going we're to jump right in. Father, we're grateful again for the chance to gather and worship. God, we're thankful for your word uh, that teaches us so clearly uh, practical things that we need for life. God, you know exactly what we need. You know exactly the areas where we need to uh, adjust and, and, uh, and change our rhythms uh, when it comes to our spending. And uh, so, God, today we pray as we look into your word, as we look at one of the gospels today, that uh, you would help us to uh, just analyze our own hearts, God. Let the Holy Spirit move freely uh, here in our midst. Uh, any distractions, God, that would be there, God, would you remove those? And uh, we just pray today that you would help us to leave uh, changed and not the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that your money is talking? That's right. Your money has a mouth and it's talking. Now, you've you probably heard the expression money talks before, uh, re- referring to the idea that, you know, uh, the people with the most money have the most voice at the table and the most influence. And unfortunately, in the world, that is typically true in the world that we live in many times. That's not what we're talking about with this series. What we're talking about in this series is that your money is talking about you. Your money is saying something about your heart. It says something about your focus. It says something about where your trust lies. And I want you to listen up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, about a month and a half, I guess it was, ago, we had our, uh, our credit card number stolen on, online. Um, we have a credit card that gives us this cash back reward deal. And so I just put a bunch of stuff on it, and then I pay it off. And it's a wonderful tool to get free money from the credit card company. It's wonderful. Um, well, we use it quite often, and we use it sometimes online, things, Amazon and that kind of thing. Uh, the, the reason I knew there was something up is because I looked at our statement, and there were, some kind of a, there were several transactions from camogirl.com. And I was like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to hunting, but I don't think I need to be shopping at camogirl.com for my camouflage, it would never fit me. You know what I mean? Um, so I called the credit card company. They sent us a new car and everything was great. We were telling a friend of ours about this and she said, yeah. She said, you know what? My credit card company called me uh, recently about some suspicious activity, some fraudulent activity. And she said, they called me and they said, look, um, it looks like you, you uh, ordered Domino's pizza 10 times in the last two weeks. And you know, that, that can't be right. Did you authorize those transactions? And she got really quiet. (laughs) And she said, don't judge me, I just love pizza. And she hung up on him right there. (laughs) I actually don't know how the story ended. But, I, but I, I do know she was embarrassed when they saw how much pizza she was eating. You know what I mean? So just a good rule of thumb. This is a freebie as we start today. Don't eat Domino's that much. That's just not good for anybody. It's not good for your waistline. It's not good for your wallet. None of that stuff. But when she saw that someone was looking into where she was putting her money, it was a little bit embarrassing. And when she knew that someone saw where she was investing her money, it was a little bit uh, embarrassing for her in that moment. And you see, each of us take our money and we invest it somewhere. We take the resources that God's given us and we invest it somewhere. And you might say, well, uh, Pastor Brian, I don't know anything about investing. I, I don't know anything about stock market. I, I don't know anything about that stuff. I'm not investing my money. That may be true that you don't know anything about it, but you're still investing your money in something. Um, you're investing your money somewhere and that investment says something about you. Can we say that together? You guys ready on the count of three? One, two, three, go. You're investing your money somewhere, and that investment says something about you. In fact, Jesus explained this idea in Matthew chapter 6. If you want to go ahead and turn there, you can reference it on the screens. Um, He actually goes after this idea, and this is what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Can we also read that together? Because this is really important as we kick it off today. You ready? Go. For where your treasure is, treasure is, there your heart will be also. We could really phrase it like this and make it really, really simple. How you spend your money always reveals your heart. How you spend your money always reveals your heart, and the order in which you spend your money also reveals your heart, and it reveals where your trust lies. Think of your bank statement or your credit card statement as a directory of your treasures. It shows what you treasure the most. It shows what you put in first place when it comes to your paycheck every single month when you receive it, whatever days it is that you receive it. It shows very quickly what you value most in life and how you spend your money. It never lies when you look at that bank statement or you look at that credit card statement and you see where your money's going because your money is talking. It reveals something about your heart. One of the things it really reveals, and this is where I want us to kind of park it for a few minutes today, how you spend your money quickly tells you whose kingdom you care about the most. 
You see, when it comes to our money, the temptation for us, just like in other areas of our lives, is to put our kingdom first, our needs first, our desires first, our wants come first because it's our kingdom first and it's easy to get our lives out of order. And you know this to be true, just like I do. Misordered priorities lead to misordered lives. See, that's true of every area of your life, isn't it? When it comes to your relationships at your home, men in the room, when you've had problems in your marriage, you and your wife have had problems, more often than not, when you go back and you look at the reason behind it, it's because you've had some misordered priorities. You've been spending too much time at work. You've been spending too much time working on that classic car that lives in your garage. You've been spending too much time hunting or too much time, if you're like me, too much time golfing or Whatever your thing is, it comes down to misorder priorities, and it leads to problems in those relationships. It's the same with your children. Maybe you've had strains in some of your relationship with your children, or maybe your children aren't behaving like you would like them to. And if you look at it and you analyze your life, you say, wow, my priorities have kind of been out of whack. I've not been investing the time in my children that I need to. How can I expect to have a good result? Because misordered priorities lead to misordered lives. And that is nowhere more true than in the area of your finances. Wouldn't you agree? See, when we get our priorities out of order when it comes to our finances and how we spend our money, it has the ability to cause a lot of destruction. Wouldn't you say that? Amen? Now, culture promotes an order of spending that puts our kingdom first. And for most of us, we like this. Now, here's the thing. This is what culture, the unbelieving culture, would say the way you should spend your money. And if we're honest, and again, I've been, in this, I've, I've been doing church work for a long time, okay? Listen, I have seen so many Christians over the years that operate under the same exact order when it comes to their spending. Like the unbelievers say, this is how you should do it, but your kingdom first. And I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of Christians over the years that put this kind of spending order, they employ this kind of method when it comes to their finances. And this is what the order looks like. They say, first of all, you're to spend your money on living. Okay, everybody say living. Living comes first. Living would include everything from your mortgage payment and your car payment and your insurance bill and your medical bills and putting food on the table and clothes on your kids and shoes on your kids and all those things. It includes things like your guilty pleasure, stopping and getting that $5 cup of coffee on the way to work every day and going out to lunch with your friends every single week or a couple times a week or whatever that looks like. It includes all the expenditures on our vacations. It includes uh, expenditures on that new car that you've you've had your eye on for a while. All those things go right into the living jar. And culture would say, this is the order in which you ought to spend your money. You ought to take care of you and your kingdom first, and you ought to live first. Everybody say live. The next category is a category called save. Everybody say save. So here's the deal. You live on almost all of what comes in in this order. This is what happens. And you get to this jar and you're thinking, yeah, we probably ought to think about retirement. I mean, we're not getting any younger, right? We ought to think about retirement. We ought to think about an emergency fund. But because living and our desires, our selfish needs, and those kinds of things take number one priority, there is rarely much left over to, to save, right? Am I right? I, I, I know for, for ourselves and our, in our family, when we first got married, this was the order in which we spent our money. And it seemed like every time we'd get down to saving, like we would save like $5 a year. You know what I mean? That's doing nothing for your retirement. It's just not. You know what I mean? But we were misordered in our finances and it led to lives that were misordered early on. So throughout this message, I'm going to give you some personal applications and personal testimony where God has intervened and moved in, in our finances in our home. And listen, I'm nobody special, okay? I'm a child of God just like many of you in the room are, and God wants you to do this very same thing. So let's keep going, okay? So we live on most of it. We save a little bit of what's left. By the time we get to this last jar, what's that last jar say? Give. There is almost nothing left. If not, there's really nothing at all left. And this was, this was what I saw in our finances. We would get down to the end of the month and be like, oh, yeah, God's told me I need to start tithing. I need to start giving. But you know what? There's just nothing left. We had that tire go out on the car, and we had to replace that. And we had that medical bill that came in. And then there was those dues that were due on the gym membership and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just joking. I don't have a gym membership. You guys, <laughs> you guys just let that one slide right past you. I don't have a gym membership. Give me a break, all right? But when it came down to the end of the month, There was nothing left. And so many people live in this order. They live and they spend the majority, if not all of it, on themselves. They save a few pennies in the save jar, and then there's nothing left when it comes to the giving. God gets the scraps. God gets the leftovers. And you know just like I do, this is a broken system, right? 
For a lot of you in the room, you've been living this way for years and you worry about finances and you never have enough and you get to the end of the year and you get your giving statement from the church and it says $37.22 and you're like, what? I thought I gave more than that. I could have sworn we did. We gave this and even though your intentions were right, maybe you wanted to give because the order of your spending was out of order and your life was misordered when it came to your finances. At the end of the day, you gave very little when it came to giving back to God. You see, when we live in this order, when we follow what culture says about our spending, listen closely, what we're doing is we're putting our kingdom first. We're putting our needs, our wants, our desires, our needs, our kingdom first. And listen, you guys make some really good arguments for why you should do this. I make some really good arguments for why I should look after my kingdom first. Because these are some of the things that you guys have said. And if I'm being honest, these are some things I've said. Can I give you a few? Thank you. I've got the mic. I'm going to give you a few. All right, here we go. All right. So here's the deal. We go, well, you know, God wants me to pay my bills, doesn't he? I mean, I, we're, Christians are supposed to be people of character. We're supposed to be people of our word. And when we say we're going to pay our mortgage on this date, and we're going to pay back this and this and this on this date for this service that we received, we need to pay those bills. And God wants me to pay my bills, doesn't he? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay my bills. I'm going to take care of all my stuff first. And then at the end of the month, if there's something left over, then I'll give that to God. Don't raise your hand. You ever been there? Ever said that? Ever gone through that conversation in your mind with the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I heard one recently, someone was sharing this with me about an area in their finances where God had really given them victory, and they were kind of laughing about this as well, so I'm not making fun of them. They made fun of themselves, okay? And they told me this. They said, we, we actually operated. We said, you know what? God doesn't want me to have debt, does he? And so we had all this debt that we'd racked up, and so what we did is we said, God, we're going to take what we would normally give you, and we're going to pay it towards debt because God doesn't want me to have debt, right? We're not supposed to be servant to other people and lenders. Like, like Christians aren't supposed to be in debt, and so we're going to take all of our money that we would have given, and we're going to put it towards our Dead. I thought that was a good one. That was a pretty unique ex- explanation there. Maybe for a lot of you, you've used this one. This is one I hear all the time. Well, you know what? I serve a lot at the church. I, I do a lot for the church. I'm always there serving. You know what? I, I, give my, I give my time. I give my talents. You know what? So when it comes to my treasure, like I don't got to worry about this jar. I'm just going to spend it all right here on me and maybe save, kick a few bucks back for a rainy day, and that'll be it, and God will be fine, and that's where we do our living, right? Well, let me give you another one. God wants me to provide for my family, doesn't he? I mean, like, if I give and I tithe, I can't afford to put my kids in travel sports. You know what I mean? Like, if I give first, there won't be money left over for me to send my kids to do travel sports, right? And I know that hits really close to home with a lot of us in the room. But it's truth. And what we're saying when we give these arguments that all of us give either out loud or in our minds as we wrestle the Holy Spirit on this thing, like you've done for years, like I did for years before God got a hold of my heart, we're we're giving arguments for why, why our kingdom should come first, aren't we? Jesus addresses this very thing later on in chapter 6. Can you guys read it with me in Matthew chapter 6? As we move down through here, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. We're going to read down through uh, verse 33 together. You ready? Here's what he says. He just set them up with this whole treasure heart thing. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Like your money's talking about what you're doing with your life. The way you spend your money, what you do with your treasure reveals your heart. And then he goes into this discourse here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, by the way. And he's talking to his disciples initially, and then a a crowd actually gathers around as he's teaching because it's such good teaching. We should perk up right here. Okay, you ready? He says, therefore, I tell you, do not, what's that next word? Worry about your life. Anyone here worried about their lives today? Anyone in the room worried about their finances today? Now, we're going to keep reading. He's going to tell us exactly what they're worried about, and it actually does tie to their finances. But I guarantee you there's many people in the room today that came in carrying a burden and a weight about their financial situation. And I would submit it might be because you've been living out of order, just like culture says. Look what he says. He, keeps, he describes what they're worried about. He says, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. All right. So the people here are worried about their basic needs and necessities. They're worried about how they're going to provide for themselves. They're, they could have been throwing up some of those arguments like what I just gave you. Well, we need to provide for our family, don't we? We need to pay the bills, don't we? How are we going to take care of our basic needs? And think about this question for a minute. Isn't worry about providing for ourselves what most often keeps us from giving and being generous? The worry about our own selves, the worry about our own kingdom, having enough for me, having enough for my family, having enough for my children, making sure that we're taken care of, it quickly makes us move uh, from being generous to being stingy and really at its core to being greedy as Americans and as Christians. 
And it robs us of the opportunity to be generous because we're worried about providing for those basic needs. I think it's one of the enemy's greatest tools in his tool belt when it comes to wrecking Christians' financial situations. And here's what happens. Listen closely. When you don't give and you don't put giving in first place, you're not inviting God into your finances, okay? And worry is the natural result. Because when God's not invited into your finances, you are in full control of everything, aren't you? Everything that happens with your money is all up to you when you don't invite God in. Isn't that true? See, uh, uh, making the ends meet is all up to you. Making good financial decisions and having a good strategy and all these things are completely up to you. And that's a weight you were never intended to bear on your own. See, we as Christians were intended to invite God into our finances, let him take the lead role with the giving and not living first, right? And then he carries that weight for us. Now, you would think on the surface If I'm taking all my money and I'm spending it on me, my family, our needs, our desires, our wants, our bills, all that stuff, you would think if you took it all for yourself, you would be less worried, wouldn't you? You would think if you took it and you spent it all for you, uh, you know, certainly, I mean, it's more money for me, so it should be less worry for me. But it doesn't work that way, does it? You know, I've said this often over the years, you know, early on in our marriage when we weren't giving consistently like like we were supposed to, um, we saw a lot of months come up short. We really did. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be rich if you give. I'm not saying that at all. But we've seen God bless us immensely. But here's the thing. I've had this conversation with many people over the years, face-to-face and even from the stage. What's weird about it, when you begin to give, you would think on the surface that giving away money or giving back money to God would make you less secure, wouldn't you? You would think that investing money back into God's kingdom would make you less secure. But it works just the opposite, It's just the opposite. I honestly, before the Lord, feel more confident and more secure when I am giving and I am tithing and I'm being generous than when I keep it all for myself and I keep it all in that first jar. Can anyone in here agree? See, those in here, and I know many of you guys are there. God's worked on your heart about this area of your giving and you've put it in first place and you've seen the change that it makes. The people here are worried about their provision for themselves and it You'll find this to be the case every time you get your life out of order with your finances. When you put living and your spending first before God, this is what will happen. It's a heavy weight you were never meant to bear. And Jesus says, there is a better way. There's a better order to use your finances. Look what he says. Keep going. He says, is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. I love this simple illustration. Jesus was a master teacher. I mean, you'd expect that because he's God, right? But like, he was a master teacher. And I love how he used the simplest things. He uses birds. Don't we see birds every day of the year? Those blasted starlings, they, they like, they're all up in this tree near our house, and they make the loudest ruckus you've ever heard in your life out there cackling and whatnot. I just, I, one day I just want to take a rock and just throw it right in the middle of them. I bet I'd take out like 10 of them. That's probably kind of cruel, isn't it? I just probably shouldn't do that. But here's the thing. We see birds every day, and Jesus gives these illustrations of these things that we see every day to remind us of these truths. Look what he says about the birds. He says, the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap, or store away in barns. They're not planting, they're not harvesting, they're not saving for the winter, all right? Or they store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He says, are you not much more valuable than they are? He says, listen, can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life Says your worry is doing you no good. You can't add any more distance to your life. You can't add any more quality to your life by worrying about it. He says, look at the birds. The birds don't worry. They don't plant. They don't, uh, they don't harvest. They don't save. And yet God provides them. Look, he gives them another illustration. You ready? And why do you worry about your clothes? Do you see how the flowers of the field grow? Talking about wildflowers here. Do you see how the flowers of the uh, field grow? They don't labor. They don't work or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. He says if that's how God clothes the grass of the field that's here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. What he's talking about that is they'd use the fire for kindling for their, to, to, be, to start the fires. He's like this temporary uh, inanimate object that's thrown into the fire gets clothing from God's hand. Look what he says. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? See, what you could take away from this when it comes to our financial dealings, you'd say, well, hey, Jesus said the birds aren't sowing. 
They're not reaping. They're not saving. They're not doing it. I should just sit on my hands and let God take care of everything. I'll just deal with like handout. That's not what he's saying with this, all right? He can say, well, hey, he said the grass didn't do anything and they got clothing for free. I'm just going to do nothing. I'm going to sit on my hand. That's not what he's getting at. And I'll just tell you, come back next week because we're going to talk about the last two jars here uh, when we come back next week. So don't miss that one. That's not what he's saying. What he's getting at is that every good thing that the birds get, the crumbs, the scraps, the food that they get from God, it all comes from the hand of God. They're not working for it. It ultimately is from the Father's hand. He says the grass gets its clothing from the hand of God, not because they work for it. And there's a principle in there for us as well. You see, yes, I know you go to work and you get a paycheck and you work. And many of you guys, you work hard for your money. And that's great. And, and as Christians, you ought to be the best worker on your team. You ought to be the best worker at your company. Just saying, that's a side message too. But you work hard for your money. But here's the thing. Y- your money doesn't come from your work alone. See, God is the one who gives you strength. God is the one who gives you ability. God is the one who gave you the talent to do your job. God is the one who gave you the opportunity to have the job. Which means the things that you get, though, yes, you are working for them, they come from the hand of God just like they do for the birds and just like they do for the grass of the fields. Does that make sense? Everybody say yes. Everything is from the hand of God, which means something. Your money and your resources, they're not really your money and your resources, are they? They're from God's hand. He is the one who is ultimately providing those things, which changes our perspective when it comes to what we do with our money, doesn't it? It changes the order in which we deal with our money because it's not our money in the first place. It's coming from God's hand. Let's keep reading. Keep going. He's going somewhere with this. He says, so don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? I'm worried about what we're going to drink or I'm worried about what we're going to wear. He says, for the pagans, the unbelievers run after all these things. That, That maybe should be the most convicting part of this whole thing. He says, the unbelieving world runs after these things. The unbelieving world puts their stuff first. The unbelieving world puts their kingdom first. He says, we're to be different. See, I'm not saying we need to be weirdos in our culture, but at the point at which you look just like your lost friend who doesn't know Jesus in every area of your life, that's a problem, church. Like, we're to live differently. We're to live with different values. We're to spend our money and our resources differently. He says, The pagans, the unbelievers are running after these things. The unbelievers are worried about these things, and they probably should be because everything they get and everything they do is coming from their own hand. It's all coming from their prowess and their decision-making ability when it comes to their finances. But he says, look, you guys know better than that. You know better than to live like the unbelieving pagans, those who don't know God, those who aren't in a relationship with Jesus. You're called to be different. You know better than that. And then he goes even further. He says, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Your heavenly Father knows exactly what you need. Remember a few minutes ago when I said, one of the things that robs us from being generous so often, one of the things that keeps us from giving is us worrying about us being able to take care of our needs, isn't it? I think it's a God-given desire to take care of the needs of your family. Men in the room, you're called as the chief uh, earner in that way. You really are. You're called to be that leader in your home to provide for your family. doesn't mean your wife can't help. That's, that's totally fine. But you're called to do that. That is a God-given desire to provide for your family. Absolutely it is. But the enemy will take that and he'll distort it and he'll twist that God-given desire to provide for your family and he'll take that and he'll place it in priority and he'll say, you know what, you need to take care of that first and then you can give with the scraps that are left over for so many christians in the world for so many christians in america today this is how we do our spending and we worry and we worry god is god gonna take care of our needs listen do you think the god that intricately designed you do you think the god that custom made you and placed you where you are do you think he doesn't know what you need that's what he's saying he's like your heavenly father knows that you need these things but don't put those things in first place. Don't put those things in jar number one in your life. And then he gives us a very clear-cut command here as we wrap this up that actually lines it all up together. It gives us an order for the way in which we use the finances and the resources that God has given us. Look what he says. It reorders everything. Verse 33. But seek, what's the word? First, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He says, seek 
me first. Seek my kingdom first. Now, this applies to the entirety of the life of a Christian, okay? This is not just finances, but it by certainly, it certainly includes our finances. And he's been talking about finances through this whole part of the chapter here, this whole part of the Sermon on the Mount. And for a lot of you in your room, you, you might be identifying with the people he's talking to right now. You're like, man, I, I have been worried, Pastor Brian. I'm, I'm worried about where my, our next meal is going to come from. I'm worried about how we're going to pay that power bill this month. I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. And I would submit to you, could it be that you've been spending and using the resources God's given you in the wrong order? Have you been dealing with your kingdom first and putting God's kingdom last? Because God gives us a very clear, Jesus gives us a very clear description and prescription for how we're to order our finances. And he says, my kingdom comes first. But he doesn't just leave it there. He says, my kingdom comes first. And then what was the promise? He says, all these things will be given to you as well. So this is what this means. Look, Jesus says, look, this comes as number one. Giving to God's kingdom comes number one. That's it. We give first generously. Then we can save. Then we can live. We'll talk about these last two later on. But he says, the giving comes first. And when the giving comes first, all these things you've been worried about over in the living category, what did he say? These things will be given to you as well. He says, but my kingdom's got to come first. And here's the beauty. What he said, if we put God's kingdom first, you don't have to worry about your kingdom. If you put God's kingdom first, you don't have to worry about your kingdom. He says, I will take care of those needs, but you have to trust me and you have to be able to give generously first and live last. You put God's kingdom in first place in your life, in every area of your life, but especially in your finances. He says, all these other things will be taken care of. You don't have to worry about what you're going to eat. We see in the Old Testament, a passage, I believe it's in Psalms, it says, he says, I've been young and now I'm old. He said, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or begging bread or the seed begging bread. That's, that's true of what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 6. If you put God's kingdom first, if you rearrange your finances, there is blessing that is attached to that when we put him in his rightful place. Now, you might ask, well, okay, so what, I, what am I supposed to give? What, what do I give first? Well, I'm glad you asked. All right, that's good. Thank you for asking. All right. God's given us a prescription for that. It's very simple. It's only a portion. It's only really a small portion of what he's blessed us with and entrusted us with, and it's called the tithe. Malachi 3, verse 10 actually describes this for us. Now, we're going to look at the first half of this this week, and next week we're going to come back and tackle the last part of that, this passage. Malachi is one of the, la it's the last prophet we hear from in the Old Testament, actually. Around that time of Nehemiah that we talked about last week, this is Malachi. He's, one of the la he's the last one to speak before everything goes dark for a few hundred years until the New Testament comes into play, all right? So, so this is what Malachi says, and he's, he's talking to God's people, and actually Malachi didn't really beat around the book. Bush. He actually called the people of Israel that weren't giving, you know what he called them? He called them God robbers. He said, you guys think you can't rob God? He's like, but you've been robbing God. He's like, he's given you this money. He's entrusted you with these resources and you've been robbing God. And this is what he tells them. This is the command. This is the simple part of it. Bring the whole tithe. Everybody say tithe. Into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Tithe is simple. It means one-tenth, 10%. That's not, the biggest, that's not the biggest amount of all the spending. We're going to get to these other two categories next week. But it's, the, it's actually the smallest of all the categories as we look at our finances. But he says the tithe is the baseline of our generosity. And this is not some random uh, uh, arbitrary command that God's made. This is a very important one. This is not like, okay, I've got like, you know, nine out of the ten commandments. Or I've got like 99 out of the hundred commands we've been given that we're supposed to do. And, you know, like the tithe one is one of the latest side. No, no, the tithe is probably one of the most important, if not the most important. And here's why. See, the reason God instituted the tithe is because he knows the grip that our money can have on our hearts. See, we as human beings, we naturally look to things that we can touch and feel and taste and see, and we want to put our trust in those things that we can see. But as Christians, we're called to live by faith, aren't we? We're called to live by faith in who? In God, our Heavenly Father, right? Absolutely, yeah. We're called to live by faith, and he knows that money is the chief competitor for your heart. Let me say that again. God knows the chief competitor for your heart is your money. That's not a place where anyone wants to say amen in church. I understand that. But listen, in our lives, especially for us as Americans who have so much more disposable income, and discretionary income than any other place in the world, it's so easy for us to begin to put our trust in money. That's why God instituted this whole thing. 
He says, if you will give back, this is something that actually, it conditions your heart for faith. It's actually an act of faith every month. When you write that tithe check or you go on the app or however it is you decide to do it. When you go in there and you give first, it's an act of faith that says, God, I trust you more than I trust my money. Amen? He says, we do this first. Before we do anything else, and I could give you more passages, but we don't have time to go there this morning. He says, give first. Because it conditions your heart. And when you think about it that way, really, here's the deal. Giving is less about your money and it's more about your heart. This is the temptation whenever pastors get up and talk like this. Number one, everybody gets really tense and they like grab their wallet. You know what I mean? Like I get that. I understand. I feel like it's part of my job to like make everybody feel uncomfortable. It's okay. I'm okay with it. You know? Here's the deal. When people start talking about this from the pulpit, this is why it doesn't get talked about much. People are like, that guy wants my money. He wants me to give him my money. I don't want your money. Listen to me, look at my face. God doesn't need your money. If God wants to do something, he has his ways. I don't know if you know this, but he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he can drop a million or 500,000 or two dollars, whatever the need is, he can drop it at will. Do you guys understand that? Do you believe that? God does not need your money, but he wants your heart. He knows that your heart will naturally attach itself to that dollar bill that's in your pocket right now if you're not careful. And so he instituted this principle of the tithe as the baseline for our generosity as Christians. So hear me clearly. When this command is given, it's about your heart, not about your money. Now I understand this too. This will be a sacrifice for most people. There are some in our midst here that have lots of money. And, you know, honestly, as we look at our finances, we talked about this a few months ago. And we talked about giving back to the foster care system and that kind of thing. We talked about how Americans have more than what you think you have. You're the richest people in the world. You really are. Even the poorest person in this room. All right? So this is for everybody in here. But here's the deal. Some people in the room have a little bit more excess than others. And that's okay. God's given it to you for a reason. All right? He's given it to you for reason. And it may not be that big of a sacrifice for you to do 10% of your income. You're like, oh, I, can, I can swing that. I can do that to invite God into my finances. But for many of you in the room, it'll be a sacrifice to give 10% of your income back to God like you're supposed to. It, it will be a sacrifice. I'm not going to make any bones about that. And I'm not even going to be one of those like, TV preachers, those health and wealth guys that are like, hey, if you give $100, you're going to get 1000 back. All right? I'm not going to do that. All right? You won't hear that out of your pastor's mouth. All right? But here's the deal. I understand that it will be a sacrifice. And let me state a little bit of the obvious here. If you begin to give back 10% of your income like God's prescribed for us to his work in the church, if you do that, that means you have 10% less money to spend on other things. You guys realize that? Like this is, this is, this is a simple math here at some extent. But when you give, there is blessing attached to the giving. Now, you've got to come back next week for this part. It's so good. It makes it all make sense. You've got to come back. But there's blessing attached when we give and we put God in first place and we order our finance the way he has described for us. I'm not saying it's not going to be a sacrifice. But the blessing is worth the sacrifice when it comes to giving. And here's the thing. I, we don't have time to do this today, but I could go around this room and I could let many of you guys who give so faithfully you give back to God what's rightfully is. And you could say, you know what? I've seen the blessing God's placed in my life. I've seen God provide. Listen, your pastor could get up here and tell you that, look, like, I, I, we're not rich by any stretch. I mean, I, I mean we, we we're wealthy in the sense of Americans are all wealthy, but we're not like, you know, we don't like Rolls Royces in the driveway or anything like that. But here's the thing. When God got a hold of my heart and said, Brian, it's time to reorder the way you do your money, we saw immense blessing in our finances. And I told you a minute ago, I'm not special None of us are. We're all God's children. But here's the thing. When we reorder our finances and we begin to live practically the way the Bible has described, and we do this, this, this uh, order right here, God has the ability to radically shape and change your finances in a way that you will receive so much blessing. It's true. Look, does it look like your pastor has missed a meal? Look at that profile. You guys see that? I have a dad bod, right? Hashtag dad bod. I have not missed a meal. God's provided. Now listen, we still have needs. Again, I'm not going to be that guy that gets up here and promises crazy stuff. But what did Jesus say? He said, seek first my kingdom. Do it first. And all these other things will be added unto you as well. Didn't he? That's a pretty good promise you can take to the bank. So here is your practical application. Close your Bibles. You guys ready? Give generously first. Everybody say that with me. You ready? Go. 
Give generously first. Give generously first. This is the order in which we use the resources that come from God's hand that have been entrusted to us. Listen, this may require some of you guys to rearrange some spending habits. This may require some of you in the room to stop some spending habits. This may cut out the 5 or $6 coffee on the way to work every morning in order for you to invite God into your finances. I've seen people sell cars. I, I, this is truth. I've seen people sell cars because they say, you know what? We couldn't tie because we had this massive car payment and, and we wanted to, we want to invite God into our finances. They would sell off cars and drive cheaper cars so they could do this and they could experience the blessing of God in their life. That might be you in the room today. You might need to rearrange some things in the way that you spend your money. That might mean cutting out some activities that you're a part of. But at the end of the day, inviting God into your finances is one of the most important things you can do as, your fa- as a family. It shows exactly where your trust lies when you give to Him first. Amen? Let me close with this. You guys close your Bibles. Anybody here have a $100 bill? <laughs> They're like, I ain't giving it to you. I've been listening to this message. Can, can I borrow it for a second? I'll give it back to you. We've already taken the offering. We're good, man. You're safe. You're safe. Can I borrow it just for a second? This is good. People have had this all three services, just so you know. So this is good. If, if you put this in the plate, it'll turn into a thousand, okay? Um, all right. I'm just kidding. I won't, go, I won't do that. I won't do that. Uh, many years ago, uh, actually, our Congress unanimously voted to make In God We Trust the national motto of the United States. It was actually back during the Cold War, and they were trying to differentiate us and, and show the difference between Americans and our faith and the Soviets, who were atheists. And they promoted uh, national atheism in, in their country. And then uh, Dwight D., or, uh, President Eisenhower in 56 actually passed a bill that became a law, and he said, we're going to put in God we trust on every piece of currency in America. And that's what you see right here. You see it up there on the screen, too. In God we trust, every single denomination of bill or coin you have is it's in God we trust right there on the money. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it ironic that the chief competitor for your heart has inscribed on it permanently in God we trust. When for most Americans, and if we're honest, most American Christians, that statement couldn't be further from the truth. For so many of us, even in the room today, who are worried like the people Jesus was talking about, our faith, our trust has been in this almighty dollar right here, this piece of paper that the scriptures say can so quickly make wings and fly away. Don't put your trust in earthly riches. But so many of us, Our money's talking. And you know what it tells us? It tells us it's not in God that we're trusting. It tells us it's in our money and our finances and our bank account that we're trusting. Amen? See, Jesus says there's a better way. If you'll trust me first, and that's exactly what you do every time you give generously first. You prove that you trust God more than you trust the almighty dollar, which so many Americans worship. And then you can truly say it's in God that we trust. Amen? Listen, your money talks. Your money's talking. What's your money saying about you? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the, just the practical nature of your word. God, I pray that your people that are under the sound of my voice right now, that they would adopt this method with their, their resources. God, this order that they would they would reject culture's order of spending and they would engage and they would adopt your method of spending and investing the resources that you've so generously blessed us with. God, in America, we as Christians have so many blessings from a financial standpoint. And you've prescribed a simple way to fuel the mission and vision of the church and at the same time condition our hearts for faith in you, not faith in our money by way of the tithe. God, would you move in hearts right now? God, it takes the Holy Spirit of God. God, I can get up here and I can convince them until I'm blue in the face and I can have the most airtight argument, but God, it's gonna take your Holy Spirit moving in the hearts of your people for them to change the way that they use their resources, even trust it to them. And so God, we pray to that end this morning. God, would you change our hearts? God, would you fuel and fund your vision and your mission for the church? And God, would you radically transform the financial nature of each family in this room. Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. Thank you for giving us this simple prescription for what to do with our money. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, let's stand right there in our seats where you're at. Listen, I'm not even gonna say if God's dealt with your heart. 
I know these messages step on a whole lot of toes. And some of you need to talk to God about it. Will you do that right now? Like, reject culture's approach, get rid of the worry, and reorder your finances in the way in which God has prescribed for us as his followers. Listen, if you need to talk to God, make that seat right where you're at in altar. Just sit down right where you're at and just pray and talk to him. Say, God, from now, it's February 2nd. This is a great time to start this. Top of the month. God, we're going to give. We're going to give first in faith, believing, proving that we trust you ultimately and not our money. If you need to make that decision, if you need to talk to God about it, make that seat where you're at in altar. Use the front here if you'd like. I'll be here in the front if you'd like someone to pray with you. Move as you feel it.